for making do on this day, and what a nice uh, song, an appropriate song for this day, when we heard just this morning that our, our choir director was out. So, but I am encouraged because, um, as you can see, our choir is growing, and what you may not have seen is I think we had 10 there with us on um, approximately on a Wednesday night, and we have the promise we'll have some more coming this Wednesday night. So we're working on building our choir um, towards the Christmas presentation that we're planning towards in December. But great job, choir, and uh, uh, great to have our choir back with us and uh, as a part of our worship. And of course, uh, today marks the third Sunday. This is the third and last Sunday that we are considering in our series that I've titled Who Cares, which is a, a mini-series over three Sundays out of the book of Malachi. And you remember that we have studied just over three Sundays. We studied first lessons from chapter one next, from chapter two next, from chapter three. And uh, we have learned that God is um, still calling us, that our God that we trust uh, does not change is the same yesterday, today, and forever, is still calling us. We still have things that we can learn from the lesson in Malachi. So we've listened, we've listened to the prophet Malachi, and today on our third Sunday, we're going to kind of wrap it up, uh, remember what we've learned thus far, and hear the message that's going to send us out um, here from the last chapter of this book. But the, the message that we have um, heard from Malachi asks us to take a risk. And today we are titling it, um, What is Your Decision? We all have a decision to make with what we learn about God. Do we trust in God? Do we trust to turn our lives over to God? And the scripture that we are to consider today on the third lesson is from Malachi in the third chapter verses 6 through 10. And this includes what Jennifer was talking about, probably the most famous passage from Malachi. But hear now the word of the Lord. Again, Malachi is speaking to us in the voice of the prophet, just as if God was speaking to us directly today. Do you believe that? Listen to what God has to say. For the scripture says, For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, have not perished, Ever since the days of your ancestors, you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how will we return? Will anyone rob God? If you are robbing me, but you say, how are we robbing you? In your tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, so that there may be food in my house. And thus put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. See if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour down for you an overflowing blessing. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. According to the prophet Malachi, this is the word that God has for us here today. And we're going to walk through this. The, the first thing that caught my attention is that very first verse in verse 6 where the scripture says, For I am the Lord, do not change. And see, this is another example of how God is speaking to us directly through the prophet. That's what we believe. But get this idea of an unchanging, immutable God that speaks to us directly is something which for us as contemporary people is so strange, isn't it? In fact, I imagine a lot of us have seen different parodies that we've seen in entertainment media about this idea. So I want to share with you something. I, I can't read this scripture without thinking of images that I've seen in uh, contemporary media of God speaking to us directly. And, and one of these is, um, this has always been one of my favorite. You remember this one? Miserable songs, they're so depressing. Now knock it off! 
So who recognizes that scene, right? Just about every hand goes up and goes, I see some people shaking their heads, but you know, this is an image that we see in the culture of God speaking to us directly. And it's kind of a silly image, isn't it? And I think it helps us to realize that when we hear scriptures like this from the Bible where God is to speak to us directly, we, we view these through the lens of our experience. And particularly as the contemporary listeners who have watched a lot of entertainment and media. And it's funny, isn't it? I mean, I'm sharing this with you today because I think that it's, 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 it's interesting. God has a sense of humor. Amen. There's nothing wrong with these kinds of things. But this is to, to get us to stop and to pause and to realize that we do view these kinds of statements through a lens, sometimes of disbelief. And sometimes we view these kinds of statements and it causes us maybe to think of our God in these kinds of pronouncements and in ways which are, are not entirely um, somber and not entirely respectful. So we maybe it, it, we don't take our Heavenly Father in these pronouncements as seriously, but, but I think I, I'm using this image because I think this is a way to remind us that we do have this here before us in black and white. For I, the Lord, do not change. And this is something that we believe is true, that we believe is um, the way that this world works. And it brings us to the point of decision. Do we believe this? If we believe that God works this way, then is our job to make a decision to choose to live our life based on this belief? This is the decision that is before us today. If we believe that God works in a certain way, are we going to stake our lives on this claim? Are we going to live our lives in a way that um, trusts that God is going to work the way that God has always Work that the same promises that were true for our ancestors in the faith are also true for us. You see, what this is saying is that if we've ever had an experience in the past where God has helped us, then can we not trust that in our future God will help us in the same way again? What this is suggesting is, and I love this quote that says kind of the same thing. It says, God doesn't save you from drowning just to beat you to death on the seashore. Do we trust that? Have we been saved from drowning? Amen. Is that why we're here? This is suggesting that that God that has saved us does not change. And that we can trust in God to operate in the same way in the future as God has operated for us in our past. It's just like the, the parable of the prodigal son. Amen. God is standing there waiting for us with open arms. Right? Not to judge us. Not to tell us what we've done wrong, but to embrace us and to welcome us and to say, welcome home. It's, I think there's a, another saying that I like that it's kind of a contemporary, uh, or maybe I, maybe I missed my, miss, miss, miss my slide, but that's what God is saying to us. He's saying, uh, God is saying, just like the prodigal son, return to me and I will return to you. The prodigal son comes running back to God. God is standing there with arms wide open, ready to welcome us. Do we believe that? See, this, the scriptures remind us of, here's the saying I was looking for. See what this means? When God is saying, return to me, and I will return to you. It's kind of like that saying, when God feels far away, guess who moved? Right? God is standing there, just like the heavenly father with wide, eyes wide open. It's we who have separated ourselves, perhaps, somehow, and of course, the relationship that we have, each of us, with our Creator God, with our Heavenly Father, is something that is between God and us. Amen? It's, it's nothing that we can discern for somebody else. See, I think the danger of these kinds of lessons, particularly from the Old Testament, is we can take these as a permission to look at somebody else and to judge somebody else's lives. No. As we started this whole series, remember, this message is specifically to the priests specifically to people like me, and it's saying, look at yourself. Look at where you might be falling short. And there was a story that came out of the news this week which reminded me of this, and I thought so strongly. Anybody see the story about the, um, the, the fundamentalist interpreter John MacArthur and his comments about the other Christian teacher, Beth Moore? Who heard that story in the news this past week, right? John MacArthur... Beth Moore, he made some very strong statements about this other teacher. 
I see some people nodding their heads. And he said that in his response to her, he said, told her that she should go home. Did you hear that? And he said that because he doesn't believe that women have a place in the ministry. And this created a big firestorm in the news. In fact, I think Dick and I were talking about this last night, and I don't think I've ever seen this issue of women in ministry so much on the public stage. But um, there are a lot of people who responded and said it wasn't, he had the right to his interpretation, right? That's his own interpretation, but they didn't care for his tone, that they felt like it was a mocking tone. Other people responded to say if it was not for women evangelists, we would have never heard the story of Jesus. Remember Mary Magdalene going for the tomb to tell the disciples? But um, what caught me was what Beth Moore said herself in response to this criticism. This is what she said. She said, I did not surrender to a calling of man when I was 18 years old. I surrendered to a calling of God. Amen. Here's the beautiful thing about it, and I mean this with absolute respect. You don't have to let me serve you. That gets to be your choice. Whether or not I serve Jesus, however, is not up to you. And I thought this was so gracious. I don't know Beth Moore. I don't know her teaching. I think this is a, you know, she, she teaches, I think, largely to women, so I haven't heard her teaching. But I caught this response. And I thought it was so gracious because basically what she's saying is it's not your place to judge my relationship with God. It's not your place to judge my calling. You see, this is so important, I think, when we teach out these hard lessons of the Old Testament, that these lessons are not for us to stand in a place of judgment and looking at other people. These are lessons that are intended to hold up a mirror to ourselves. You know, and I, I believe there's even a spiritual principle here. And you know what it is? I call it a spiritual principle. It's Mind your own business. Amen. Amen. M Y O B. I think there's a lesson there. Mind your own business. And I love this story, right? Because I think this is backfiring on John MacArthur, right? He has didn't mind his own business, and I think he, he he's reaping the rewards of that. But see, this is what God is saying. God is saying, return to me. And I will return to you. He's speaking to us. He's not speaking to somebody else. He's saying, look at yourselves. We're not supposed to use these teachings to judge somebody else. But instead, it should cause us to hold that mirror up to ourselves and question whether we are truly as devoted to God as we purport ourselves to be. And I love what this verse says in the message translation, Malachi 3.8. This same verse, he says, Begin by being honest. You know? See, I love to look at some of these other translations because it puts it in a different perspective. You know, another way of saying, look at yourself. Begin by being honest. God says to us. And we think, oh, well, that can't be so hard. You know, just to begin by being honest, to look at ourselves. But you know what? In my experience, sometimes the hardest thing for us to do as human beings is to be honest with ourselves. To see ourselves accurately. And there was an article that caught my attention about this. Who knows the, the magazine, The Babylon Bee? Who knows the online magazine? It's kind of a version of The, of the Onion, right? But it's for Christians. It's got a Christian perspective, but it, it shares these kind of spoof news stories. And, and this article really caught my attention uh, this week from The Babylon Bee. It was called, Study, Everybody Else's Sin is Much Worse Than Yours. Right? A purported study, right? And the, the study confirmed, it says that while your sin is regrettable, but not that bad, everyone else's sin is horrible and should be repented of immediately. And it gave this graph, I thought this was hilarious, right? And it's, uh, this is from the Babylon Bee, if you see that little icon, the Babylon Bee. Relative badness of sin. The sins you struggle with, really not that bad. And the sins other people struggle with, Whoa, Nelly, that sin is bad, <laughs> it says. See, the point being, it's very, very difficult for us to be honest with ourselves to see ourselves accurately. And this is the, the quote from the article. It says, the vast majority of sin that your Christian brothers and sisters struggle with is awful. The report read, while the majority of sin that you habitually commit is pretty minor. The report went on to state that, frankly, God probably doesn't care that much about your sins, so just keep doing them. 
You see, and we laugh. Why? Because it's not true. Right? It's a joke because it's not true. Because God does very much care. God gives us these commandments about how we are to live our lives because God does care about how we live our lives. Just like a parent makes rules, a good parent makes rules for a child. Why? Not to harm that child, but to, to help to prosper that child. Right? We do this for our own good. I see a mother looking at a child. Right now we make these rules, amen, for the children's own good. And that's how God, our Heavenly Father, also works. And so that's why we have to begin by being honest with ourselves. I'm reminded of how, you know, what is honesty? We say it's not just cash register honesty, right? It's, it's deep, fundamental honesty. It's kind of like when we say to our, our children, you say, well, why didn't you tell me about that? And the, and the child says, well, I didn't lie. I just didn't tell the whole truth. You know, what do you call that? That's called a sin by omission. Amen? That's called a lie by omission, I think, in, in my house. But what this means is we have to start pointing out where our neighbors fall short. And we have to start looking at ourselves, at where we might fall short, at where things may not be working out the way that um, they, would, they would do if we were following in God's way. And um, what God promises us in the way that God works is that if we do this, then God will have... God's part. It's kind of like, you know, when you make a, a, a compact with your teenager and you say, okay, you take care of this part and your parent will take care of the other part. Do we trust? Do we trust that God will do what God says that God is going to do? And that brings us to the next part of the lesson where God says, test me in this way. Test me in this way. And there's no other scripture, I, don't, I can't find any other scripture in the Bible where God challenges us to put God to the test. To say, if you do your part, then I will do my part. In fact, isn't it kind of amazing that we can trust God for eternal things, for things like our salvation, for things like trusting of where we're going to go in our diet? Yet, how many of us actually do this work God has suggested? Put God to the test with the practical things of our life, with the smaller, the earthly things. And what is the test? We've heard that this is the part that we've all heard before, right? Bring the full time into the storehouse. That's what Jennifer was talking about. What is God saying? God is saying that if we do our part, then God will do more than our part. If we do our part, then God will make things even better than what they would have been if we hadn't done our part. It's one of these most amazing promises that we have in the Bible, but how many of us actually do it? How many of us actually live our lives that way? Trusting that if we just do this small thing, then God is going to do for us a great thing. Of course, and I'm glad that, Jennifer, isn't it interesting how the kids... Don't know that word, you know. I knew that word when I was a child, but I can see how in this generation some of these words have come and fallen out of favor. But what is the time? Jennifer was talking about it. Some of us were fortunate, weren't we? When we were young, you see, I had my, I don't know if I was fortunate. I was watching a, the Cosby show the other day, and he said Theo's allowance was $8 a week, and I thought, my allowance back then was only $1 a week. But I did not remember it because I had, it was $10. Who of you grew up this way? Ten dimes, right? We were given ten dimes. And the point was that the first dime was to go into the offering plate. See, that was the blessing. I was taught that this is how God works. If I am faithful and put that first dime in the offering plate, then God is going to pour out a blessing, which means I'm not going to miss that dime. In fact, I'm going to have so much more just by that act of faith. You see, that's the way that God says that God works. And God is challenging us to say, here, will you put me to the test? Isn't that amazing? See, it's not rocket science. It's just doing that little thing that we were taught to do when we were children. And how many of us have fallen away from that faithful practice today? You see, I love that idea of an overflowing blessing. Amen? A blessing, the other scripture in the New King James, it says, a blessing that is 
is, is too great to measure. The blessing that you cannot contain. Amen. If we just give that one portion of what we have, then God is saying, put me to the test. Amen. Am I faithful to my promise? I have one last story I want to share with you. And I, I made this story up especially for the holiday today. And it's about a little boy who went trick-or-treating. A little boy about Evan's age. What is Evan? About five years old? Okay, a little boy about Evan's age. And he went trick-or-treating with his mom in the neighborhood. And he went to the um, door of a neighbor, of a man, um, who was one of their best neighbors. And the man had a big bucket of suckers. And the suckers were that little boy's favorite candy. Little boys love suckers, don't they? Right? And the man held out the bucket of suckers to the little boy, and he said, reach in and grab a handful. But the boy, uncharacteristically, was being shy. He didn't reach into the bucket. And the mom looked at him, and the man looked at him, until finally the man reached in and grabbed a handful and put it in the little boy's bucket. Okay, well, the mother and the little boy were back at home and pouring out all the candy out of the bedspread. And the mother asked the little boy, she said, that wasn't like you to be so shy. How come you didn't put your hand in and get the lollipops like the, the man asked you? And he said, Mom, that man's hand was way bigger than mine. <laughs> Can you see the point of the story? The point is that God's hand is way bigger than ours. Amen. The point is that God's generosity is way more than ours. The point is that God's love is way more than ours. And so God is asking, will we not put this to the test? Will we not trust in God's strength and not our own strength? Do we believe that? See, that's what God says. And see if I do not open the floodgates. Amen. We just do a small part. And let's let God do the big part. It's kind of like what Jesus said. He said, there was a man who built his house on the rock. And the floods came, and the winds came, and the storms came. But the man's house is stood. And that's the very point, right? We have a decision to make. This is the decision time. What is your decision? Do you trust that God is the same, that God's going to do what God says that God's going to do? Or are we going to go things our own way? Are we going to build our house on the rock? Or are we going to build our house on the ship of the sand? That's the message of our God. Do we trust? Do we believe? What is your decision? Thanks be to God this day.